I'll go on now um, to introduce Professor Hazel Bout from uh, Coventry University. Um, Hazel is, has worked at Coventry University since 1992, and in 2006, she was conferred a chair in development uh, geography. She's currently acting executive director of the Center of Society and Social Justice. Her research focuses on the traditional harmful practice of FGM in Africa and amongst the African diaspora in the um, EU. She leads the EU diaspora third multidisciplinary replace research project researching female genital mutilation intervention programs linked to African communities in the EU. Um, she's an internationally recognized expert on female genital mutilation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jane, and um, thank you for inviting me to this very, very important meeting. And, uh, and a good morning to you all. Now, you might remember many adverts that we often see on the TV where they suddenly say, and here's the science bit. You know, many when it's about hair shampoo or face cream or something like that. Well, if you like, I'm the academic bit here because I've been asked to talk to you um, and introduce female genital mutilation. My experience is that although people might have heard the term FGM, they don't always know what it means. So I do apologize if you already know much of what I'm going to say, um, but I can assure you there will be people in the room that won't always know what I'm going to say. So please bear with me. As we've already heard, FGM is a deeply rooted traditional practice that affects the health and well-being of millions of girls and women worldwide. It is also a human rights issue, as we've heard. But what is it? The definition of FGM, female genital mutilation, as defined by the World Health Organization is up on the screen for you and is around the room. It's all procedures involving the partial or total removal of the female external genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs for, and I, this is my emphasis, non-medical reasons. Okay, that's the important bit here. It's for non-medical reasons. We've already heard that it is um, concentrated in those regions with highly patriarchal societies. And as our last speaker has just um, explained, it is used very often to control female sexuality. Majority of FGM, or, cut, or female cutting, is performed on girls under the age of 15 years. But in my research, both in West Africa and amongst the African diaspora in the European Union, we found that babies as young as seven days have had FGM performed on them. And I have come across elderly women in their 60s who are widowed, not sexually active, are beyond childbearing years, who have opted to be re so that they are clean and pure for their maker when they die. So this is a highly complex issue. We tend to talk about the FGM as if it is one thing. FGM varies between communities, between ethnic groups, between belief systems. And the World Health Organization has got a four-fold classification of FGM. I'm not going to read all of these. You can read them for yourself. Um, and if anybody wants a copy of this PowerPoint, I'm more than happy for you to have it. But what we have here is a fourfold classification um, of FGM, varying in its physical intensity, if you like, on the female genitalia. There is one to add in type four. Type four, we have now added labia stretching. Labia stretching has now been discovered um, to be being performed in populations from East Africa down to Southern Africa, countries that we don't normally associate with FGM. So labia pulling, I can say more about that if anybody wants to ask questions. What I will say is that this classification is very much a Western classification based on Western medical um, ways of, of, of looking at um, 
at our bodies. Many communities that perform FGM do not identify with this classification, and it is very difficult um, for us to say that a woman has had type 1, 2, 3, or 4, because it might be a combination or a mixture. And many communities do not like the word mutilation. If you talk to communities and say, is FGM performed in your, in your communities, they'll say no, because they don't regard the cutting that they are doing as mutilation. They are doing it, as we've already heard, for what they perceive wrongly to be for the good of their daughters. So when we're working with communities, we might not want to use that terminology. And in our work, we do not use the word FGM. When we're working with communities, we, we clearly use it when we're talking to professionals and, and politically uh, campaigning, etc. But you might need to be aware that other words are being used, like Sunnah. Little Sunna, Big Sunna, Pharaonic, Kitan, etc., etc. So I, I would say that we do need to be very careful on the terminology we use and this classification because it is very Western dominated. Now, as we've heard, FGM can have very serious health impacts. This is just a diagram I put together indicating some of the health effects that women and girls might suffer as a result of having had FGM performed on them. Problems urinating, cysts, infections, infertility, complications in childbirth, increased risk of newborn baby deaths. We've heard some of this information already this morning. But what we have to bear in mind is that not all forms of FGM will necessarily produce some of these very serious consequences. And very often, much of the campaigning that's been done to end FGM has emphasized these very serious health effects. And, um, and, and some people would argue that type 4 does not produce these serious effects. These are very often overemphasized and associated with type 3 FGM or infibulation. And I think this is one of the reasons why the health message has not got through to communities. It's like the anti-smoking message. Um, well, I knew somebody, and they smoked all their life, and they didn't die till they were 99 and a half. Okay? And it's the same. I've had FGM. I didn't have any of those health effects, or I didn't have many of them, or very few of them. But, and I survived, so what's wrong with it? So we need to be aware of this health message. And for me, it has been a bit counterproductive in that what have people done when they've heard these health messages? They've said, right, we won't do type three, we'll do other types of FGM. We'll do the less invasive forms. Now that might be progress, but it, it's still against the law, and it is still going to cause harm. Because one of the things that we, we don't talk about enough, I believe, um, when we're talking about FGM, is the psychological impact of FGM whether it's a full infibulation and having to be cut on your, on your wedding night so that your husband can penetrate, etc., or it's just a prick to, to have a little bit of blood as a symbolic form of, of FGM, that's traumatic. That's really traumatic for a child and a woman. Just think about, ladies, when you go for your cervical smears, how you feel. You know, um, it, it's... Sorry, men, but... Um, we ladies have to go through these things, and it is not always the pleasantest experience, and we grit our teeth and we get on with it. The other um, impact, if you like, of, of pushing the medical message is that families are saying, well, if there, are, if there might be all these medical consequences, then I'll find a doctor to do it. So we've got this trend in medicalization. More than 18% of all FGM cases globally are performed by healthcare providers, even in countries um, where it is against the law. And we don't necessarily mean that it's being done in hospitals. It could be being done in somebody's house, um, in a private clinic or whatever. And in fact, one, the case that's currently being prosecuted in this country is uh, one of the um, people being prosecuted is a medical doctor. So we know that there are health consequences 
But we also know, and we've been told, that FGM is an extreme form of discrimination against women and girls. These are just a list of various international protocols and conventions under which FGM could be or should be banned. So we've already heard that it's a violation of women's right to good health, to security, to physical integrity, to life, because in many cases, or in some cases, FGM can result in death. And the UN recognize FGM as a cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, which is tantamount to torture. So we have both medical evidence that FGM is, is harmful, and we know it's a human rights abuse, and there are all these, these conventions. Despite all of this, the numbers of people, or numbers of women and girls who are cut, continues to increase globally. This is despite the fact that in 1979, the World Health Organization called for the elimination of FGM globally. The figures, we've heard some of these figures already this morning. Um, it's estimated that there are about 125 to 140 million girls and women globally who have been subjected to FGM. Just think of those numbers. It's probably an underestimate. Every year, three million girls are at, globally are at risk of being cut. The UN have um, identified 29 African and Middle Eastern countries where they believe or they classify the practice as concentrated. And in those 20, 29 countries, it's estimated 125 million uh, girls and women have been cut. And if we look at those list of 29 countries, we're going to do that in a, in a second, four countries alone account for two-thirds of all the women cut. Those four countries are Egypt, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and the Sudan. If we were to end FGM in those four countries, we would have um, globally eliminated two-thirds of, of, of cutting. Those 29 countries are that the UN has identified as being the areas where FGM is concentrated very hugely in their culture, their belief systems, etc., etc. I've put them up here. I've classified them into five groups. We've got countries where there are very high prevalence rates, where more than 80% of women are cut, and down to countries where very well, much lower levels of prevalence where the prevalence rate is less than 10%, but will be concentrated in a, 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 an ethnic group. What I want to just say about this, this slide is that these are not, FGM is not just performed in Muslim countries. It is not a Muslim belief, as we've already heard. Many Muslim countries do not have any form of FGM. There are many Christian countries or Christian groups that perform FGM. If we look at Sierra Leone, parts of Ethiopia, Egypt, etc. So this is not a religious practice. And I would also say that although the data is collected by country, we are really talking about ethnic groups. So if we looked at Nigeria, for example, we would find that FGM is concentrated in a few ethnic groups. The same in the Senegambia region, for example. So the international borders are actually not helping us in, in fight the fight against FGM in certain ethnic groups. I'm a geographer, so I have to have a map. So here's a map of female genital mutilation prevalence. This is the percentage of, of women and girls cut in each of these countries. You will see that the countries that are shaded in red are the ones with the highest prevalence levels. But I would just point out to you that it is not just Africa in the Middle East that is shaded red. We tend to focus on Africa, and as we were told earlier, um, you know, that, that Leila Hussein said, this is not just an African problem. It isn't. It is a problem for Africa, but it is also a problem for elsewhere. So, for example, if you look in Southeast Asia, you will see that the red shading there is, in fact, Indonesia very, very high levels of, of 
FGM in Indonesia. We don't focus on the Indonesian community in this country at all in terms of FGM. We don't focus on Malaysia, Singapore, etc. The other thing that I wanted to draw your attention to in, in, this, in this map is the shading of the UK and Europe. It's shaded pale green, which indicates that within some communities in those regions, 10% of women and girls have been cut. So this is showing that FGM is not concentrate, just concentrated in those red countries, that migration, movement of people over the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years, has meant that FGM is now a global problem. In the European Union, we don't have accurate figures, um, but it is a criminal offence. And the European Parliament in 2009 suggested that there were half a million women and girls in the European Union who had been cut, and that a further 180,000 girls were at risk. And they identified certain European Union countries as those which had a particularly serious problem. And those were countries which had significant numbers of migrants from FGM prevalence countries, the countries that we've just seen on the previous two slides. I was looking at the data yesterday and I was horrified um, to see, and the data is not necessarily 100% accurate, but from the data that I was looking at that's been issued um, by the um, European Union, that the UK has the highest number of women who have been cut and the highest number of girls at risk of any country in Europe. And I think that is um, shocking. So what are the figures in the UK? Well, we don't have accurate figures. We have to hypothesize. We are beginning to collect accurate figures as we've heard from our hospitals and clinicians, etc. But the um, House of Commons Home Affairs Committee, which reported in July 2014, estimated that there were 170,000 women and girls who, living in this country who are survivors of FGM. And it is estimated that there are 65,000 girls aged 13 and under who are at risk of FGM in the UK. And I just want to, to say that um, it's not often said in this way, but FGM is the single largest cause of child abuse in the UK. If you think about the figures, it's quite shocking. We've already been told about the figures are in Coventry. I'll just repeat them for you. According to the 2011 census, the council believe that there are, are just under 1,000 children or girls under the age of 15 in the city who are at risk of FGM because they are daughters of mothers who come from high prevalence countries. And the estimates suggest that there are 5,500 women aged 16 to 49 living in Coventry who come from countries where FGM is concentrated. And, and the chances are, are very high that they will have been subjected to some form of FGM. The UK, as we've heard, um, has had a law prohibiting FGM now for 29, 30 years. There are posters around the room if you want to um, look more carefully. Um, the first um, act was published, uh, became an act in, in 1985, so it's nearly 30 years ago. This was updated, as we've heard, in 2003 to include um, taking a child or a woman outside of the UK to be cut and bring them back. What is shocking is that we've had no successful prosecutions. I won't say any more. Um, but for me, if we look at the numbers that I've just showed you from the UK, we look at the, the length of time we've had this law, I would, I'm going to be very controversial, but I'm going to suggest that the law clearly has not been a deterrent to these communities. So, why is FGM still practiced in the UK and here in Coventry? Well, 
as we've heard, it, it's very, very complicated. It's parents doing it to their daughters and parents feeling very pressured to do it on the daughters by the community in which they are living. So it's highly complicated. Why are they doing it? We've already heard. It's associated with reasons of religion, although when you delve deeper, it is actually not religion, it's culture. Things about hygiene and aesthetics come up over and over again in the work that we've been doing. Being socially accepted into the community, being able to marry, there's a great deal of intergenerational pressure here. We tend to ignore the elders in these communities, but in our research we have found that grandmothers are very, very powerful in perpetuating FGM on their granddaughters. And this diagram is just um, a diagram from the World Health Organization, which sort of summarizes some of these issues. So what we, what we have is FGM is what we call a social norm in the academic world. It's where individuals' actions are interdependent on the actions of others, including the family and the wider community. In other words, I might decide I do not want to have my daughter cut, but the pressure on me by my, by my family, by my community is so great that I feel I have no choice. And if you read the quote there, um, this is from a UNICEF report, it really summarizes it. Even when parents recognize that FGM can cause serious harm, the practice persists because they fear moral judgments and social sanctions should they decide to break with society's expectations. Parents often believe that continuing FGM is a lesser harm than dealing with the negative repercussions that not cutting will have. This, to me, um, it is quite a serious issue. We know that social norms are enforced by community. We've come across, uh, in our research, people who have said that they continue with FGM because they are fearful of witchcraft, of the supernatural, of juju, of voodoo particularly in the West African communities. It's something that we just, it doesn't come into medical, um, Western medicine. We don't consider that, but we have to because it's very powerful. So we have a social norm. We need to change it. We need to get to this tipping point. So how do we do that? We believe, um, with the Replace project, that we need a new approach. We need to, to really try and question those social norms. We need to end FGM, but we need to do it by working with communities, because clearly the health messages, the legal messages are not getting through. And we have devised um, a new approach, which is cyclic in that we target influential people within those communities, we support them and we help them develop interventions that might make a little change in terms of moving towards ending FGM. So for example, I'll just quickly give you an example. We're working in the Netherlands with the Somali community there and what the community have come up with is said, well, we continue FGM because we're told it's a religious imperative. We're Muslim, it's religiously you know, important that we do it. And then when you, but when you talk to them individually, so in a group they'll say that, when you talk to them individually, they say, well, I don't actually think that it is. So what have we done? We have spoken to Quranic teachers. We didn't get a very good response from imams, so we've gone to Quranic school teachers, and we've helped them develop um, a lesson plan for their Sunday schools or their, their Quranic schools, and we have included Quranic um, scholars. We've got a DVD so that these teachers have got the confidence to actually stand up and, and say that this is not a religious imperative. In London, what we found is that in the Sudanese and Somali community there, men and women don't talk to each other. Men, when you talk to men and tell them what FGM really is and the impact it has on women's health, they are shocked very often. 
We have to get this, and, and, and men will say, this is a woman's issue, nothing to do with me, I don't want to hear about it. And very often in these meetings, I can go to meetings like this and there'll be hardly any men in the audience because they don't regard it as their issue. So, to conclude, clearly safeguarding children from FGM is vital and we have to make sure that we do that. We have to implement the law and we must provide medical services for survivors of FGM, in particular psychological services. Our project, and we have a stand at the back here, so happy to talk, and we've got members of the team here as well if you want to talk to us. Our approach is community focused, it's culturally sensitive, it puts the community at the center of change, and we try and understand the belief systems and barriers to change, and that varies from community to community. We also recognize that individuals on their own can't always change their behavior because their behavior is determined or enforced by the community. So this approach we are introducing as part of the Replace 2 project. And we, what we, we've called ourselves Replace because we want to replace one social norm that supports FGM to a social norm where FGM is ended. We strongly believe that change must come from within communities, that these social norms which perpetuate and continue FGM must be challenged, and we are there to help and advise if anybody would like to speak to us. And we're very, very happy to be part of Coventry City Council's initiative to end FGM in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you.